Hi everyone, Russ of Aquarimax here. Hopefully everything is working just fine. Get my mic adjusted here a little bit. Uh, how's that? Does everybody hear me? Hey, Frank the Tank's in the house. Jamie Buffamonti, Azer, Terminus, Miller, Moon Over Miami. Greetings and welcome. Welcome to the stream. Glad to have you here. We've got a lot of cool stuff going on today. Got some questions from patrons. Got a little budgie, Twilly, on my shoulder. Hello, Twilly. Say hello to everybody. Or not. If you want to say hello to me, that's fine, too. Um, I see that Newt is here as well. Drowned Snail, Ashley in. Excellent. Got some great questions today from Patreon uh, supporters, too. Okay, don't mess with the microphone. Okay? You going to mess with the microphone? You're going to be good. Hey. It's Richard from the Tarantula Collective. Excellent. Welcome. Snailientologist, Daniel Lopez, Tip Top Taylor, and Katie Brandon. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Okay, I'm going to put you on my shoulder. And don't mess with the microphone. You got it? Okay. You don't want to go on the shoulder? Where are you going to go? Okay. I see that Dale is here as well. All right. So, one thing I'm going to try is the, uh, I'm going to try two dual cameras myself. I've done that before with uh, other things. With StreamYards Live with others, I've done it with, uh, I just haven't done it on a YouTube live stream by myself with two cameras, uh, I don't think. Maybe I've done it once. You know, I've done that before a couple times. I just haven't done it in a while. So I, would, I wanted to do that to help honor requests of some of the patrons who sent in some things they wanted to see and, and so on. So I'm going to pull open the uh, the notes from the patrons and we'll get started on some of the questions. For some reason, the chat just stopped. I froze. What's going on there? Okay. Reading glasses time. Just a second. Let's see what it says here. All right. Well, Ashley N. wanted to know about Hawaiian shrimp. And just to give you the short uh, version first, and then since Ashley is in the chat. If you have other follow-up questions, uh, you're welcome to let me know. But uh, just had a, I was mentioned Hawaiian shrimp on the Patreon page saying the oh, live stream is coming up. And so I have Halocaridina rubra, also known as the uh, Opaiula, or the Hawaiian red shrimp, Hawaiian cave shrimp, has various names. Uh, I have had them since I lived in Hawaii. I got some when I was there, I think around 2004, 2005 and have had a population ever since. They've been breeding for many years. Um, I've sold quite a number of them. I did get some new stock as well. So uh, I have some that's purely descended from the ones I brought home, and I have some that is a mix between the ones I brought home and some others that I got here. So um, yeah, they're very cool. They're one of the easiest shrimp, probably the easiest invertebrate to keep, because how many other invertebrates can you leave alone for five months or more and uh, come back and find them all fine, like completely alone? So. That's, that's basically those shrimp. They breed much more slowly than, say, uh, cherry shrimp. They are also a much more, um, they have a slower metabolism. They're smaller. And they live in brackish water. They can survive for a short period in fresh water, but not very long. They can survive indefinitely in salt water and even hypersaline water. But they don't breed very well at those salinities. They breed much better at uh, a salinity between fresh and salt. I keep mine at about 50%, you know, right? But right between uh, freshwater and saltwater, and that works great, but I've kept them at lower salinities and bred at that, those salinities as well. The exact uh, salinity is not too critical because they are adapted to fluctuations like many brackish water animals. And they're super cool. And there, there are some color variants now. There are banded versions that are kind of like the Riley uh, Neocaridina shrimp. There are some orange ones, some white ones, some yellow ones, I think. I've even seen them some that look kind of green. And Elaine Smith, I love it. Let's get a love button. Oh, Jamie's going to draw some cool ice spots. Awesome. You know, I was thinking to do uh, YouTube memberships, thinking about doing those, and um, and then having isopods be the icons that you can get for being a member. That kind of sounds fun. Um, <laughs> and they are very fun, actually. They look very much like a, a red cherry shrimp, but they're not like... They vary much, they vary a lot in how red they are. 
just like red cherry shrimp, I guess, but uh, the red cherry shrimp have been bred for so long to be very, very red. These are naturally sometimes like blood red, and it depends on the location, but it also depends on the environment they're in and the, the amount of light they're getting and things like that. Some of them are just blood red, and some of them are a little faded, some of them are pinkish, and when they have been in the dark or when they've been spooked, it can be transparent, essentially. So their enclosure, I have some in a 10 gallon, I have some in a 5.5 gallon, I have some in a three gallon, and some in a two gallon. I think those are the setups I have right now. And basically, you just put some aragonite sand on the bottom, some lava stones or something like that if you want. They, they tend to like to hide in their crevices, but it's not vital. And then you just put the 50% uh, salt mixture in there. You let it cycle for a while. That's key. You have to have algae growing there before you put the shrimp in there. Put them in there and they're off. And you feed them about once every week or once every two weeks. If you don't feed them for a month, they're fine. If you feed them too often, the water quality will you know, not do as well and they won't breed. But super, super easy. I do have a lot of videos on them actually. So I have one called uh, Opai Ula, the best pet invertebrate. That's my most recent uh, video. Like I had them in live streams once in a while, but that's the most recent video I've made that's just focused on them. And I, I recommend checking that out for sure. And I have some other ones too. Some of my oldest videos are actually Opai Ula videos. And yes, Richard, this bird steals the show wherever he goes. And if you haven't seen the video with this guy on Clint's uh, reptiles on that channel, it's um, the budgie parakeet, the best pre reptile. This guy was on there just, was it a week ago or two weeks ago that he was on there? And so was I. It was a fun video. So if you haven't seen that, go check that out on Clint's Reptiles. It was a really fun video to do. Um, Twilly here had a ball. And so did we. My daughter and I were both there, of course, and that was fun. And Eileen O'Donnell. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I, am, I will be showing the baby garter snakes today. Uh, I think it was Ashley who asked that, uh, if we could show the garters. So I have them right here, and we're going to be showing them in just a minute. So I have some of the baby garters. I didn't bring all of them, all 21 of them downstairs, but I brought, I think there are eight in this enclosure. So actually a bird, and he's using this human puppet. I can neither confirm nor deny that, Frank. And whoa, Tip Top Taylor. That's an interesting idea for a tattoo. What kind of isopod are you thinking of doing? Hair Wade, hello. Moon over Miami, hello. J-Man, nice to see you here. So Ashley, I have kept uh, aquatic hermit crabs, a couple different species. In Hawaii, I kept Calcinus levimonis. I've kept the blue-legged hermit crabs, probably a couple more aquatic hermit crabs, but. And you could probably do them in a two gallon, but they are definitely more effort than Opai Ula, than the Hawaiian shrimp. The Hawaiian shrimp are going to be one of the easiest things you ever keep. The key is you need to cycle the tank, like I was saying. But if you do that, they're basically bulletproof. If you don't do that, they'll die. So those are, that's the key there. And, and Sherry, I think you agree. He agrees with you. That's the sound he just made. So. And Tip Top Taylor, it's hard to beat Armadillidium vulgari. Definitely you want to get one with some color on it, though. At least some little spots on the back or something. So, so Jamie, would it harm the isopods if they get a small bit too much moisture? It depends. With some species, it can be a problem. Uh, and with all species, I mean, too much is still too much. But it depends on what you mean by too much moisture. By too much moisture, you mean there's a swamp in the bottom of the enclosure. Then, yes, it's a problem. You'll want to... To rectify that, remove most of the substrate and replace it with a little bit drier substrate. If, if you just mean there's a little bit more moisture than normal, but it's not like you don't pick it up and squeeze it and drops fall out of your hand, then you're probably okay. But make sure there is ventilation and make sure that with armadillidium, I'd try to make sure there's at least a dry area they can go to. So if you have it like that and you replace one quarter of the substrate, so it's three quarters moist and one, quart, one quarter uh, dry, then they'll probably be fine as long as there's enough ventilation. So theropod hunter, European goldfinches, domesticated in America. I'm not sure about that. We do have some goldfinches here. I'm, I'm not sure if they're the same type or not. Uh, but that's an interesting point. I wonder about that. So tip top tailor, a little rubber ducky somewhere too. Yeah, yeah, that would be iconic for sure. Ben's bugs, hello. And Elaine Smith, 21 babies is pretty good for a first litter for a red-sided garter, Thumnophus hirtalis parietalis. 
There are garters that have far fewer babies. If you are familiar with snake discovery, and I, I know many of you are, um, snake discovery, they have, uh, what kind of garter? It's a, it's a hybrid garter actually that produces like maybe eight or nine at a time because some species of garters produce uh, larger young like that one and fewer of them and others produce larger numbers that are tiny and the red-sided garters tend to produce larger numbers of babies that are very small. The record that I've heard for a garter snake to birth at once is 101. And I think most of them don't get anywhere close to that. But 30 or 40 is not uncommon for a large female uh, red-sided garter. It's just, this was my female's first producing season. So 21 is not bad at all. She did brewmate, which helps improve fertility and whatnot. So if I hadn't brewmated her, I don't know that she would have had as many. But then again, they weren't having the you know, going through the winter. They didn't want to go through the winter without brewmating. They were being very uh, uninterested in food, hiding a lot. They really, really wanted to brewmate, so I let them. And it, it worked out for breeding, so. And Dale, excellent. Glad the channel is helpful for isopod care, and you're welcome. And Peace Sevilla is a great isopod, so I'm glad you're enjoying those. Wavering Darkness, A. Werneri, an awesome choice. Hey, thank you, Richard, to buy your co-host a bird treat. That's perfect. What do you want for your treat? Yeah? Okay. I think he wants lettuce for his treat. So I can buy him a whole head of lettuce and he can have a very small proportion of it or something like that. But thank you, Richard. Really appreciate that. That's awesome. So Ben's Bugs. Porcelli Ornatus Witch's Brew. Excellent. That is, that is a great uh, morph of Porcelli Ornatus. Welcome, Sean Meister. Um, let's see. And Waver in Darkness, I have kept mantids, don't currently have any, but I've kept a few species of mantis. I love them, they're great. Uh, my only, the only downside with them is they don't live very long, really. So, Eileen, 21 babies is great. That's a huge clutter, I think. Well, it is, it is pretty good for the, for the first litter, certainly. It's, it's good. And for some species, that's huge. So Leon, blackish orange started with the normal powder blue. Is powder blues black orange and a mix of these three colors? Got to see these. I would love to see these. Can you send me some pictures of these guys? Vicabulous, hello. And Eileen, uh, that's not grim. That's just reality. Uh, and there was one. I only found one stillborn. So not bad. I mean, uh, especially, you know, first litter. I didn't know exactly what to expect, if there were going to be these slugs or anything. No slugs that I found, just one stillborn. Cool, Theropod Hunter, the Cinnabar Moths. That is cool. Okay, okay, so Jamie, you got the fungus gnats in there. Springtails will help. Uh, and vocabulous, it's, it's kind of hard to prevent them, that's true. But you can mitigate them. But I am working on a biocontrol that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be making a video. I'm, I'm already working on the video about a biocontrol. It may be the answer. It's not, I'm not the one who discovered it, but I may help popularize it. So, Oh, we got another super chat from Richard, the Tarantula Collective. Went to feed the Armadillidium klugai Montenegro. You sent me a few months back, and there's an explosion of little babies in there now. Awesome. You're doing something right, Richard. That's great. I'm glad they're doing so well. If you haven't seen Richard's video on the unboxing of the ones I sent him, that's some of the best footage of Armadillidium klugai I've ever seen. He has great uh, cinematography skills uh, with a macro lens. He does some excellent work. And that combination makes this video just mind-blowing. I don't know why it doesn't have more views, honestly, because it is super cool. So if you want to see Armadillidium klugai Montenegro like you never have, Go check out the Torrential Collective. I know a lot of you already watch Richard, which is great. But if you don't, or if you haven't seen that video, go check it out for sure. Oh, Vicabulous, thank you for the super chat for isopod food. I, I go through a lot of that, as you might guess. Um, so I appreciate that as well. All right, here, Wade, any inhabitant suggestions for my paludarium? I know you've you've asked about this, so give me the lowdown on the paludarium, like how the setup is, um, and that will help. So, 
Ashley N, zero gnats. It has zero gnats when I make substrate hydrate it with water that's mosquito bits have soaked in for an hour or so. Strain the kernels. Since I started doing that, I don't have gnats. And that stuff does work. Um, I had uh, an ivory millipede colony that I may have lost due to fungus, um, mosquito bits to control fungus gnats. It certainly worked on the gnats, but the colony slowly died out and I looked up some research. The only reason I'm not using the fungus, uh, the mosquito bits against the fungus gnats is that um, this may have this issue. It says the studies have been done in the wild that invertebrate uh, biodiversity basically plummeted in areas where mosquito gnats were used over time, like over a year or two. And so I'm kind of reticent to recommend them anymore, but Ashley's having success with them and it's been a while. So how long has he been using those, Ashley? Um, Eileen O'Donnell, one slide the ice pot enclosure completely with yellow sticky tape strips around the top. Really kicked their butt. And I do love the yellow sticky strips. I, I hang them up in the closet where I have my isopods. And yeah, as long as isopods can't get to them, they're great, uh, great way to do it. So Jamie, thank you for popping in. And thank you for catching the replay. That's important. It helps me out. And I know a lot of people who can't watch this, watch it later. So greetings to you. And thank you for doing that. So. Oh, Elaine Smith, a uh, vampire crab. An eight-year-old son of your friend wants one for his birthday. Yeah, vampire crabs are, are super cool. And I have um, studied them a little bit. I've never kept any, but... Basically, their habitat is a lot like a dart frog habitat with a pool. Um, dart frogs don't necessarily need a big pool, but the um, vampire crabs benefit from a pool. But yeah, it's basically a very humid, planted uh, setup with a pool, and they will do pretty well. They also like to eat isopods. So you can um, feed them dwarf whites. The, the baby crabs grow really well on dwarf white and other isopods. Um, Oren McMonagall raises the vampire crabs and uh, found out that isopods are a great food for them. They do a lot better. And congrats on the Ornatus uh, theropod hunter. Expecting. And I have kept hermit crabs of various types, both marine hermit crabs and the land hermit crabs, but it's been a long time. Biggest kinds of isopods? Probably Bathynomus giganteus, the largest species. It is a uh, an oceanic species. Very, very big. But... Uh, Needless to say, I don't have any of those. Uh, my One of my local aquariums has some, which is super cool. All right. So I am going to look at some of the Patreon messages now. Um, let's see. I think I answered one of them, but there's one from Cappy, which is the newest uh, patron. Uh, the very newest patron joined this afternoon and says... Um, Cappy says, I have a question for a future streamer video. I think I understand the science of why isopods need moisture to keep their gills wet and breathing, but why do they need a dry area and what makes some species prefer more dry or wet substrate? This is a great question, and there are a lot of factors involved here, and I don't understand all of it completely myself. I did read a study that said that isopods can get uncomfortable in humidity that's too high, but I'm not quite sure I go or I agree with that or not. It's difficult to say, but there are a lot of factors at play in airflow in high humidity, uh, airflow, humidity, and ventilation. Temperature plays an effect, uh, plays a part too in all of this. But uh, apparently, isopods, according to Orion McMonagall's book, Isopod Zoology, an isopod can desiccate at 100% relative humidity if there is enough airflow. Interesting, right? Um, there are a lot of factors going on here, but basically the way I look at it is I would like to know more about it myself, and I wish I had better information for you, Cappy, but basically it's all about providing gradients so the isopods can osmoregulate um, and, well, they're, they're regulating everything. They're regulating the humidity. They're regulating the amount of water they're taking in, which they can take up directly in high humidity. Unlike many of us, we're not able to do that, but they can do that, which is pretty cool. Um, basically, it's all about providing gradients so that they can find where they need to be at different points. And I think you already know that. But some species seem just to need it more. And some of the giant uh, Mediterranean, Porcelio do. Some of them seem to need high humidity and high airflow. Some need to need, seem to need 
low humidity, high humidity, and high airflow. And so providing a gradient will help them find that spot. But yeah, I don't really have a better answer for you at this point. I wish I did, but I'll, I'll try to look into that a little bit more. Because I think it's a great question. Okay, now I'm going to look for some other questions. Oh, wrong link. Just a second. Okay, we've got eight comments. Cool on this. So let's see. So I talked about Ashley's shrimp question. So Sandy Sizemore wants to know about easiest and cheapest ISOs. Okay, super easy. Porcelia Levis, like Dairy Cow or Cali Mix or Orange, something like that is easy. Porcelia Scaber, super easy. Um, Silisticus Convexus is super easy. There's another one. Um, actually, most of the Armadillidae and Vulgari are pretty easy too. So there's a few really easy ones. Not all of those are cheap, but most of them are. You can find Armadillidae and Vulgari morphs that are cheap and easy. And I will say Armadillidae and Maculata and the Zebras are pretty easy and cheap as well. Most challenging are expensive ISOs. So the large Spanish Porcelia, like Porcelia Expansis, Porcelia Ornatus High Yellow, um, Porcelio bolivari are supposed to be very challenging. I haven't kept that species yet, but uh, those are all pretty expensive still. And rubber duckies, maybe not very expensive. I mean, maybe not very difficult, but certainly expensive and not the easiest isopod to keep. So I would put those on the list. And anything from the Marulanella group, that's some of the fancier Marulanella, like the tricolors, um, very expensive at this point, hard to get hold of. Um, the ember bees and the bumblebees uh, from the Marulanella group and various other Cubaris species like Shiro Utsuri, the spikies, stuff like that. I would put those on the expensive group. I don't think any of those are particularly difficult to care for, but definitely expensive. So let's look at another one. Um, Sandy is curious again if uh, neighborhood pet stores sell isopods. Has, she hasn't found one. I wonder when that will happen. Well, I'll tell you what. About probably seven years ago, something like that, a pet store manager contacted me. Those of you who watch Clint Reptiles will have heard the name Animal Ark in Orem, Utah. He talks about that store quite a bit. He um, borrows uh, specimens from that pet store to do, you know, uh, species profiles on because it's a great pet store. I've been there. I started going to that store over 20 years ago, and the store's been there, you know, obviously a long time. It's a great store. Uh, it has changed uh, management, of course, since then. But uh, seven or eight years ago, I think the manager was still the same. I, if it's still Mike, I think it's Mike. Uh, I used to live close to that store. I no longer do. But seven or eight years ago, I lived closer than I do now. Before that, I lived even closer to the store. I used to live within five minutes drive, and now it's you know a little over an hour to get there. Anyway, I go there when I can. But about seven years ago, the manager contacted me, drove to my house, about an hour away from the store at the time and picked up a bunch of isopods. And now the store sells isopods. I don't know if any of the stock that he sells is descended from the ones that I had or not, but I actually picked up my starter colony of Armadillidium vulgari punta cana there. And now that colony, uh, which was very small at the time, you know, a starter of about 10 isopods has grown into many. So there are pet stores that carry them. Uh, they're just not as common as, you know, certain other things, but it's, it's happening. Definitely. They, they do carry them now. Sounds like Ashley has a store that's an hour away that does, but yeah, she mentions that shows are a great place to get them. You can talk to the breeder and get hints and you can decide what you like. So one more question from Sandy, where do you see the isopod collecting hobby? Not just for bioactive, but just collecting for fun going in the next couple of years. Well, I think the Marulanellas, we're getting a uh, you know, several Marulanellas that are really brightly colored in the hobby. We'll probably get some more of those in the hobby. Uh, we may get some more genera that we don't know of. I think some of the reef classification is going to occur. And as far as regulation in the hobby, I don't know. My fervent hope is that those in positions of making these decisions will see that there are a lot of tropical isopods that are not going to pose a risk to the uh, ecosystems here and they will deregulate them. That's what I'm hoping. I don't know if that will happen. And I'm also hoping that hobbyists will do their part by um, being careful and responsible with the isopods that could potentially introduce, you know, establish themselves and become invasive here and be very careful with them and demonstrate the responsibility that will 
allow those who are in positions to make those decisions to allow us to keep them and uh, you know, transport them and trade them and, and so on and keep the hobby alive and doing well. So I hope those are some things that go on. So Sarah Yendry, my favorite unkillable bioactive plant other than pothos. Well, pothos is up there. Um, lemon button fern is kind of a crazy one. Uh, if you want one that's pretty unkillable, at least if it's kept humid enough. Uh, that one, I think, is, is a great one for that. Um, ficus pumila, just the normal ficus pumila is another one. And honestly, snake plant, sensibaria, uh, really, really does well in a variety of vivaria from dry to um, tropical. So I, I would recommend that one too. Okay, well, thank you, Sabian, for coming in. I um, I enjoy it when everybody comes in. I'm sorry I can't catch all the the chat, but you know I do what I can. Okay, so Ashley says when she uses the mosquito bits liquid straight in the enclosure, she lost some powder blues. So adding it to the substrate seems to be work, and since fall of last year, it's working. So that's awesome. So my favorite species of isopod. It's really hard to say. Expansis is definitely one of my favorite Porcelio species. But it's so hard to say because there are so many that I love. It's basically the one I'm working with at the moment. So Snailiontologist, any tips to breed copepods? I've produced a lot of copepods, but it, they're generally incidental in other cultures, like in my Daphne culture, in a scud culture, that kind of thing. I, I have never tried to produce them in mass, like huge amounts of copepods, but they do seem to thrive under the conditions that Daphne do. Oh, see, letting it sit for a couple of weeks, Ashley, I wonder if that, that may have a lot to do with it, and then adding the springtail. So that's a good point. That's a good, good tip. Thank you for bringing that up. And IS, or is, um, thank you so much. I, I'm glad you find that my passion is palpable, because I feel it a lot, and I wonder how much of it comes out on the video. And so I'm glad that you see the uh, passion and enthusiasm, and I'm glad it's helpful. So Tip Top Taylor. Hmm. I have some papers on genetic research uh, in isopods. I have a collection of them. I'll have to go through and see. I think someone posted some on arachnoboards.com. So if you look that up, I think someone posted some links there. And Alex, yes, that isopod zoology book by Oren McMonigal is, is great. So Jayman, your spikes are still alive, but zero luck with reproducing. Hmm. So no monkey at all, huh? And that's, that's interesting because all of your Cubaris are like going to town. You, you have a, the green thumb for the Cubaris. You just keep them and they, they have tons of babies. So that's, that's awesome. But I'm wondering why the, the spikes aren't doing that. Okay, Tip Top Taylor has, scale, has isopods and rubber duckies. Awesome. Reliable care guides for spiny flower mantis. Not specifically um, for that species that I can think of. Trying to think, uh, I'm pretty sure Bugs in Cyberspace has had that species and probably has some good information on it. And Rick, I'm glad those uh, dwarf whites are working in your vampire crab paludarium. Outbreed the crab's predation, that's perfect. So the crabs are eating them, but they're outbreeding it. Perfect. You can't, can't ask for better than that. You've essentially got a self-sustaining uh, dietary item in there. That's, that's awesome. And congratulations, Ben's Bugs on the Porcelio spatulatus. That is great. So Ashley Ann has another question. What animal or animals sparked your interest to start learning more and start more and sharing more and starting the channel? Hmm. Well, I started the channel in about 2000, I want to say 2011. So it's been like 10 years since I started the YouTube channel, something like that. I think that was what I did. Anyway, at the time, most of my videos were about fish. And so you could say they sparked me to start uh, the, uh, the channel. And I was doing a podcast, which was weekly. And so the isopod, I mean, the, the videos were infrequent. I was just kind of randomly posting video. I might post a video one month and not post anything for three months. And then I'd post one and then maybe do another one the next month and then nothing for six months. And I did that for a few years. It wasn't until 2016 that I started doing more frequent videos on a schedule and, you know, kind of taking it a little more seriously. And the channel's grown quite a bit since then, of course. Um, 
I had fewer than 2,000 subscribers when I started uh, taking it seriously. And now I have over 4,400, almost 4,500 now getting there. So I would say part of what, um, I, of course, I keep fish still. I'm breeding fish right now. I, I have several aquariums with fish in them. And I think I'll always keep fish. I always want to. But I think something that sparked me to do more with the channel was getting into reptiles and invertebrates. And I started you know, doing more things with those on the channel. And uh, I guess, I guess that's, that was it. Started with morning geckos and isopods that started me doing other things, branching out a little bit. And then I started doing millipedes and, you know, things like that as well. So Ashley wanted to see the, the newest additions, the little snake. So we will be doing that in a minute. We still have time for that, right? Yep, we do. We're clicking along here. Uh, so what's it like for a snake to have live young? Well, basically, uh, there are a lot of snakes that have live young. She's asking, do other species have live birth versus eggs? Yes, a lot do actually. Boas. Boas uh, tend to be uh, live bearers. Rattlesnakes tend to be live bearers. Um, other snakes that are related to... Um, oh, I just got another super chat. Thank you, Suzanne Johnson, for the super chat. That's awesome. Doesn't look like there's a message there, but very much appreciated. I really, really appreciate the, the stream. Uh, donating, everyone who does that on the super chat is awesome. It, no, I appreciate everything everybody does. It's great. And the super chats really make a difference. So thank you. So back to your question, Ashley. Uh, a lot of snakes that are related to garter snakes, like ribbon snakes, which are almost garter snakes, and other snakes that are closely related uh, give live birth, like decays brown snakes do that. I think ringneck snakes give live birth. There's, there are quite a few snakes that do. And in some of the snakes, at least, there is kind of a placenta-like structure that allows the uh, snakes to, to get uh, nourishment. But in a lot of cases, there's still, like a garter snake is still kind of in an egg case, a very thin um, sort of sack that's like, a, like an egg, but it's very, very thin, not really a shell to it. Um, so they usually call snakes ovoviviparous, meaning they retain the eggs until they hatch. And the, the eggs themselves are sort of vestigial structures. The shells, at least, are, are vestigial structures. So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that helps, and we'll see the snakes in just a minute. Um, so some basic info about cichlids, Sandy says. Um, seems a lot of people breed them. Yeah, I have bred several types of cichlids. And cichlids are basically a very interesting group of fish. They're a family of fish that tend to, be, uh, tend to exhibit what appears to be high intelligence for fish, um, pair bonding behavior in many cases, um, nesting and parental care behavior in many cases. And that varies, the types of parental care they give from uh, keeping the eggs in the mouth until they're old enough to be more independent and then they can swim out and swim back in and parents will protect them, things like that. Um, in some cases, they will just, they'll build a little nest and defend that nest and defend the young. In some cases, they will feed the young with the secretions on their skin. And there are so many different types of cichlids. So those are some of the, the characteristics that they keep in common, they have in common, but things like angelfish, which most people are familiar with, the freshwater angelfish are examples of cichlids. The shell dwelling cichlids, those are the only cichlids I keep right now, but they are very small, probably the smallest species of cichlid. They're, the males are the largest at only a couple of inches long, and they spend their lives revolving around snail shells. So uh, they spawn in the shells, they protect themselves in the shells, sleep in the shells and whatnot. So a lot going on with cichlids. A lot of the, um, you know, the African cichlids are very brightly colored, and there's a lot of variety in the species. I had a tank of those years ago. So I hope that kind of gives you an overview of cichlids and how they work. Um, they're, they're pretty fantastic. So young lad, mold has never been a problem when you put the dog food in because you always take it out before it can get moldy. I also put it on a little plate so it doesn't get wet and so crumbs don't get anywhere. And I often do something like that. I'll often use a magnolia leaf or a cork bark piece or something to put food on that could mold because then it's less likely to and easier to remove. So Porcelio Morocco babies keep dying. Wow. Well, I haven't worked with that species, Ben, but what kind of, uh, you have four vents, your room is 77 degrees to se 75 to 77. Hmm. Has anybody else worked with that species? Because I have not had it. So I'm not sure what to tell you there. And I wouldn't want to give you some crummy advice because I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so Vati, what do you do for enrichment? Do you cycle the arrangements for your inverts on the same basis as your herps? Not really. I think 
uh, enrichment for the the isopods comes probably mostly in the fact that they are constantly remodeling themselves uh, in the enclosure to some extent. They're nibbling on the, the wood pieces that I put in there. They're uh, nibbling on the leaf litter. And so by adding new leaf litter in different configurations, adding new hides, that kind of thing, um, I guess that, that would qualify as enrichment of a sort. And, oh, Eileen O'Donnell put a super chat in there. I'm a grand snake father now. <laughs> I love it. That works for me. I like that title. I claim it. What do you think? You think it's a good title, Twilly? Yeah? I do. He seems dubious, but I like it. I think it's great. Okay. Is everybody kind of ready to see those snakes? Because I am. I'm ready to see the snakes. I'm going to try to put them on uh, the snake cam over here. I, I tried to do double camera duty here so that we could see, um, see that going on. So I apologize for the temporary disappearance. I'll be back as soon as I can. Just trying to load up here the stream. Okay, so I'm coming back. Don't worry, I'm, I'm staying here. So I can see uh, you want to see the snakes. So I'm going to allow the camera in, going to mute the mic into the studio. And it's going to be looking at this ceiling. Uh oh, hold on. Okay, I just had to kill the audio on that. Um, it should be muted, but it's not. <laughs> not sure why it's doing that. Okay. I'm going to mute that one and show you this one. I'll try this anyway. Let me see if I can. Hmm. There. Okay. Can you hear me? Everyone let me know if you can hear me. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm really working on that. I'm trying to get that fixed. But we're going to see if we can take a peek at these little, uh, little guys. Let's switch the camera over here. Perfect. So, can you hear me? Let me know. I want to make sure you can hear me. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. Sorry about the echo. That shouldn't technically be happening. Obviously, it is anyway. But uh, I had the audio killed on my phone, but it wasn't working. And there, we're back. Okay, good. So I'm a little far away sounding, but you can hear me. That's good. Uh, hopefully, I'm sounding better. This is the snake setup for eight of the little critters and it's going to be a little harder for me to check the chat you can see the water bottle the water dish is basically empty that's just because for the stream the purpose of the stream i was moving this so um that's what i wanted to do um here let me see just checking some yeah so you can see everything going on um please uh let me know in the chat uh how things are going you know, periodically, so I can I can monitor because the chat seems uh, kind of empty right now, for whatever reason. So I want to make sure I get some feedback how how things are going. I'm going to move a few things around so you can see the baby snakes. Here's their humid hide. I don't know if anybody's in there. It doesn't look like it, but you can see there's humidity in there. There's the water dish. Let's lift up one of these hides. See what we can see. Oh, look at that pile of snakes. Looks like most of them in there. Okay, so I'm coming in quiet. I'm going to see if I can uh, talk more loudly and see what I get. All right. Can everybody see the snakes? 
Okay, you can hear me better. Great. Um, I'll keep going. So they are pretty awesome. Loving these little guys. And Michelle, these are red-sided garters. They're Thamnophis sertalis parietalis. So not the California red-sided. There's a lot of confusion between the two species. This is a Montana locality. Do you notice they usually flinch when something comes from above? Once I pick them up, they're fine. They're really pretty... Uh, pretty docile once I pick them up, but they don't like to be surprised from above. Okay, let's see if I can check the chat. There we go. Look at the noodle friends. Yeah. The sweet spaghetti. Love it. They're so fun. And they are now eating, most of them are eating really well. Out of the 21 snakes, 20 of them I can confirm they ate. I cupped them all in deli cups on, I think it was Saturday. Um, they'd already had a couple of feedings, but uh, cupped them all individually and fed them all. Every one, uh, every, 20 of them ate, 20 of them ate at that point. Um, and I was able to confirm it. One of them did not. So I took the three, the four most uh, reluctant eaters and housed them together so I could keep closer tabs on them in a smaller enclosure. And now three of them are eating kind of like pigs, although some of them are a lot more interested in taking fish than they are in taking the uh, pinky puree, but they uh, are doing pretty well. And then the one, I'm not sure it's eaten yet, but I'm trying, you know, I'm gonna cup it again soon and try again. And yes, I love the little red specks. Oh, there it goes. That's one problem with them. They still uh, trying to figure out balance and they don't have enough length to sort of regulate the balance in the same way that the larger snakes do. So I'm going to take out a couple more hides. I don't want to freak them out, but I do want to pick up a couple more and have you get a good look at them. So they're eating every couple of days, Sarah, um, like maybe every uh, two or three days they're eating. So that they're getting like fed three to four times a week. Uh, garters do eat a lot more often than, you know, say corn snake babies or something because they're, they've just got higher metabolisms as adults. So my garters eat two to three times a week. And these are eating three to four times a week, every couple of days there. So like I said, they do not like to be startled from above. And that's really my only, my only complaint with this enclosure is that it's, it's top opening, but it's kind of hard to get a front opening enclosure for little garters. Once you pick them up, they're completely docile. This is actually a really docile species. Uh, Scott Felzer, Felzer, whatever his name is, kind of a garter snake expert who's kind of not around anymore so much in the hobby, but he uh, was really, really breeding a lot of interesting garters, and he says this is a very docile species, and I have, uh, I tend to agree. I've been keeping it for a few years now, and they are super docile. They tend not to bite even when they're feeding, although I, we've had accidents. Last time I fed, our female feels like she's still catching up from having given birth, I think, and is really ravenous and sometimes gets surprised. You know, she surprises me. So she latched on my finger the other day when I was trying to feed her. Wouldn't let go for a minute. Um, so I think their bellies are kind of yellow. Um, Sarah, how often are they eating? I told you that. When, when do you think they're old enough to go to their future homes? Now that they're eating, except for those four, I want to keep, I want to hold those four back until I know they're eating really, really well. But everybody's out. This is eating like champs. So they're actually ready to go. And I do have a waiting list. And those of you who are on it, expect an email soon as I, as I work out some logistics for getting these shipped out. Hello, Cullen. So let's see if I can get a shot of their bellies. One of the adults has a really red, yellow belly and the other ones have kind of a green belly. I'm going to see if this one will let me <laughs> show its belly. I don't know if it will. Oh, got a little shot of it. Kind of yellow. I hope that helped. Oh, Michelle, thank you for the Super chat. Excellent. The Garter Snake Food Fund. And they do eat a lot, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> now they go through a lot of pinkies. These guys, of course, are not taking full pinkies, yet they're taking pinky parts. Uh, it's kind of gross, but that is what they eat. Um, also, earthworm puree and fish. They're taking endlers. Um, especially the, the picky ones really want the endlers. So... so um, they don't musk 
much at all. I haven't been musked at all by these babies. And the only time I ever got musked by one of the adults was just like right after the mother gave birth. I think she was still a little bit stressed from the whole process. And she must then, but she had never musked before that and has not musked me after that. Just once. And the whole time I've kept them and only one of the snakes. And she kind of had a good excuse, let's face it. So she she had been through a hard time. And so she uh, kind of, I kind of had that coming, I guess. I think I surprised her a little bit too much. They don't like to be surprised. If they if they get surprised, um, they're not, you know, they'll, they'll just kind of spook a little bit but they're super docile when they know you're coming and they'll come right out of the tank to, to, you know, not even just to eat. Even when Ruby was refusing to eat when she was heavily pregnant and was not interested in food at all, I could not get her to eat for about two weeks. She only took like one pinky in the middle of all that. Um, she still wanted to come out. She would want to come out and explore and, you know, play around on my hands and stuff. You can see they're, even when they're young, they're pretty tame. And I've been trying to handle these a good bit when I can, so that helps too, I'm sure, just to sort of socialize them. And I'm curious, since I'm kind of colorblind and can't see this all that well, I can see the markings on them, but how red do they look at this age? You know, the adults get pretty red when when they have the markings. Not all of this morph, or this, not morph, this locality and this species, um, this species doesn't have the red markings to the extent that the Californias do usually, but it does depend on the locality. It depends on the individuals. I have some males that look, you know, my males look pretty red a lot of the time, but I'd like to know about that. So Ashley Ann, thank you so much for the super chat towards the mini boops. Well, I can't think of a better cause. That's pretty cool. All right. Let's see. Elaine Smith. I hope that the four that are not eating will start to eat like pigs. And they have most of them. Three of them are actually eating a lot. They're just eating pickly. They will not eat everything the others will eat. I think two of them are now taking the, the pinky mix. Uh, but then one of them is only eating the fish. And at first, they, they would all only eat the fish. And now two of them are taking the pinky mix. And one of them is, is, is only taking fish still. And then the last one is not really eating yet. So the markings are kind of looking brownish now. That makes sense. But some red in the pattern. Okay. That makes sense. Two. So Kuro Roku. Welcome. I'm glad you showed up here. Even if it was random chance. That's pretty neat. And Ashley, okay, much red, more of a rusty color, more tan and yellow on them. Yeah, yeah. And my my little ones looked a lot like this when I got them, and they reddened up later. So Therapod Hunter. Oh, like Draco Volans, the flying dragon lizards? I have not. Uh, they're super cool, but I have not owned them. I would totally do it, though, if I had a setup for them, and I could and try to get them breeding and whatnot. I think there are people breeding them, whom might I remember. Should I put this one back and see if another one wants to... Ooh! There's, they weigh so little and they just... They move in unpredictable ways compared to the adults. It's kind of... They feel dumb when I drop one, but... Of course, they have very little mass, so... It doesn't really cause them a problem, but... Yeah, like I said, they don't like to be approached from the top. At all. Once I get them up off the ground, they're fine. I have to be very careful picking them up. Not to hurt them. So, Vicabulus, do you have any other reptiles? I do. I've got, of course, the adults of these guys. I've got, we've got a corn snake. My son owns a corn snake here uh, in the house. We've got, I've got a breeding population, breeding colony, I guess you could say, of morning geckos. And I've had that for many years. I've also got, uh, we've got some crested geckos and we've got a leopard gecko. And I believe those are reptiles. Okay. Well, I would tell you, young lad, I don't recommend picking green leaves and then drying them. You're going to get some different uh, 
chemical composition that way than you would if you were using desiccated leaves. I would say it's better to, at this point, if you don't have any already that are dry, to dry them yourself rather than try to, I mean, to buy them rather than try to dry fresh leaves. So Eileen, that is a great question. Um, I, I think, to be honest, I'm going to sort of cross that bridge when I come to it. I'm going to try to get the snake to eat on its own a few more times and then see and how it does. I'm going to, I, I do think that I will probably talk to Don's garter snakes before I make any decisions on that. Um, after I, you know, after I get it going, I mean, if I can't get it going, I'll probably talk to Don, Don's garter snakes and see what, what can I do with this one that's not eating? Because force feeding a snake this small or even assist feeding a snake this small is kind of tricky. So I, I, it looks like the bug hub. I got a super chat from the bug hub for the great information given at any time. Excellent. Well, thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Okay. Okay, Michelle Bailey, do you have any plant recommendations for bioactive garter snakes enclosures? They will squish a lot of plants. Lemon button fern has been great for me. Um, a lot of the pothos can do well in there. Um, the snake plant, no pun intended, and uh, Korean rock fern. These are ones that were recommended to me by the bug, I'm um, the bug hub, the, uh, the bio dude. Oh, look at, you can see the belly, oh, not anymore. So I am going to go ahead and settle on, I talked to Don's garter snakes about giving a reasonable price. He said 50. So these are going to be 50 to those people who are on the waiting list. If you want to get on the waiting list, just email me. Um, there may be a few more spots. It's kind of hard to tell because some people haven't exactly decided exactly how many they want. And, you know, some people will, um, when I contact them on waiting lists, it's just a thing with waiting lists and I don't take it personally at all. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, I was going to do it and I've decided not to, which is totally fine. And so I'm not sure exactly how many spaces there are on the waiting list, but you can go ahead and get on it if you want doesn't cost anything to get on the waiting list. You just email me and say, I'd like to be on the waiting list. And this is what I'm interested in. You know, I want a pair or I want just one or whatever, um, like that. Yep, and actually Don said I could get 50 for them easy. So I could probably charge a little bit more. But I'm figuring 50 is a fair price and uh, I'm going to, of course, charge express shipping, FedEx shipping too, in addition to that. So uh, uh, 50, I'm, I'm happy with 50, that works for me. Hey, Scott's Animal Adventures, hello. And I do think these are these make great pet garters. They, they're better than some of the others in that they are quite a bit more docile than some. And they are also not, you know, I can't guarantee these are going to show up looking just like the California red sided because most of them probably won't. Some of them are going to look really nice and have some nice red on them probably, but others may not. And you never know. But they tend to be more docile than the, the red sided. I hear, I've seen some docile red sided, the California red sided. But I've also seen, you know, some that aren't and heard of some that aren't, so. Hmm. Well, I think what's going on, Jason, about the permits and the isopods is that not everybody, so I, there are not very many people who are selling rubber duckies with the permits. There may be some, but generally, I think it's just kind of, people are not uh, worried about the permits too much when rubber duckies are being sold. <laughs> I think that's what's going on. But I don't think that if this is overly concerned with people owning isopods, that, I mean, owning rubber duckies specifically. And I, I think they recognize that they're not, you know, a huge danger because they're not going to be able to live in most parts of the US. And so perhaps they're just not as important a priority as some of the other things like phasmids. Okay, so Scott Animals Adventures, 
Any advice for getting armadillidium gestoid breeding? Or have I missed isopod q &A? Oh, cool. Thamnophis scalaris. One of four people in Europe trying to be trying to breed. That's awesome. There's so many cool garter snakes out there that people don't even know about. I was looking up um, some of the Mexican garter species. There are some fantastic ones people don't even know about and don't even keep here. Um, and then there are some species that you can keep in Europe that we can't keep here. The San Francisco garter snake. I can't remember the Stemnophis uh, tetratania, I think it is. Something like that. We can't keep it all here. Um, so that's pretty cool. Interesting young lad. The young ones seem to like to squash more than the adults. Welcome back, Cody. Yeah, Jason P., I think that's kind of what's going on, as far as I can tell in most cases. And sow bug species in the hobby, definitely. Um, all of the Porcelio genus would qualify as, as sow bugs, as would some others. I would say uh, Oniscus ocellus would qualify as sow bugs as well. Um, basically, any isopod, terrestrial isopod that doesn't roll up could basically be considered a sow bug. So, yeah, quite a few species would count in that group would be considered under that umbrella. Well, well, I would kind of like to check. I'm going to come back to the, uh, the main screen now, if you don't mind. And um, I have a better microphone over there and kind of wrap up the show there. I'm going to, um, And unmute myself. Whoa. No. Ah, that's not working at all. Let me see if that helps. Okay. I think we're doing okay now. How are we doing? Um, okay. Yep, Oniska Day in general, I would say. Um, well, yeah, I would think so. Um, all right, so we're back. Good. Okay. Sorry about the uh, issues, the, the technical issues, but hopefully got a good look at some of those little snakes. I really enjoy uh, just sharing them with everybody. They're, they're a delight. They're messy. Cleaning up after them is not fun. And I won't lie, but because these are not in a bioactive, and so it's a lot harder to do. But I love them; they're awesome, and I'll look forward to uh, raising the little guys and gals. Yep, here's a little birdie. Do you want to say anything to the people at home? Want to greet them? No, not particularly. If you haven't heard him speak, check out my uh, the garter snake video that I released about the babies being born. He is at the end of it speaking. You can hear him speak quite clearly, so it's kind of fun. If you want to hear him say, excuse me, he does in the, in the, the video at the very end. So check that out if you haven't already. Or re-watch it if you missed the end, and then you'll get to hear him speak. He doesn't speak on command, but he does talk. Um, and let's see. Ah, you're welcome, Ashley. Uh, I'm glad you asked about it, because it's, it's really fun when uh, people ask about it. I, I get excited about it. So I, I'm glad you wanted to see them. And theropod hunter. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. So yeah, not necessarily the aquatic, semi-aquatic types. Ooh, so Jason found some peace caber with a riddle virus. It's kind of sad. I mean, they're beautiful, but it's sad because, you know, they're dying. So very sad. I know that Orrin McMonagall was working to try to isolate a strain of blue ones. I think before he realized that it was a riddle virus that was causing it. And so he was trying to breed for it and he couldn't get it to work. Uh, but he was working on it. And uh, actually, when the orange ones turn, when they have a rid of virus, they turn purple, a very striking purple. So that would have been fantastic if it hadn't been fatal. From what I understand, some of the crayfish in the hobby actually have a rid of virus, but it's a benign form that doesn't kill them. And so they're infected with this completely harmless rid virus. I wonder if someday they could produce an attenuated rid virus for isopods that just changed the color and didn't hurt them. Who knows?
So the true Oscar J, have you ever, hmm, there's a typo there. I'm not sure I understand that one there. But it is just about time to go. Anybody have any last minute things to say? Oh, Frank DeTank, wild powder oranges with black splotches. Would love to see some pics of that, Frank. Got to get those into the hobby for sure. Someone else was talking about something like that. Totally want to see that. I think that would be fantastic. And aquatic isopods. Does Carolina Biological Supply have some? Have you checked there? So Scott's Animal Adventures keep them more humid. You have the Panda Kings. Um, I think I would keep uh, fairly low ventilation and more humid. That All the Cubaras seem to do pretty well that way. Um, deep substrate, more humidity than not. Uh, low ventilation and moist substrate. And thank you, Cody. Thank you, everyone. We've gotten some really nice uh, super chats today. I really appreciate that. And I should probably wrap up about now, but uh, just keep watching. I'm doing some fun unboxings and things coming on in the next few uh, weeks and got some, some fun things in the works. So I'm um, keeping in touch. And if you want to be on the uh, garter snake waiting list, just send me an email and I'll put you on. Like I said, can't guarantee that there will be enough, but it doesn't hurt to get on there. So everybody have a beautiful evening. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.